Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to call this regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order on Monday, September 18th. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I may have a motion to go into executive session for personnel and discussion of lease negotiations. Uh, do I have to read everything else, Kate? No. Okay. We have a motion. Mike moves. Sarah seconds. All in favor? Okay. We have a motion to go into regular session. Sarah moves. Mike seconds. All in favor? Okay. Next item on the agenda is. Do um, you want to move George up and. Uh, Matter, around. Okay. You're going to want to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, first I'll hear first <laughs> elections report. <laughs> yeah. um, on September 11th, the Monuments and Ceremonies Commission held its annual 9 11 Memorial Observation Ceremony at Darianne's 9 11 <coughs> Monument at Middlesex uh, Middle School. I feel it's really important that we take a moment each year to remember those that lost their lives and those that gave so much of themselves that day. And I also hope we remain united and hopeful about the future. Hurricane season has begun in all of the town Darien departments with responsibilities related to emergency preparedness remain proactively informed and ready. Last Wednesday, we had our quarterly meeting with Eversource regarding emergency preparedness. I recently received a tour of the Hemlocks treatment plant um, which plays a crucial role in providing clean and safe water to the residents of Darien. The tour led by CEO Don Morrissey provided valuable insights into the intricate processes in ensuring water quality. And we have um, George Logan here to give a little bit more on, um, on water. Yesterday I had the pleasure of starting the 43rd annual, 43 years, can you believe that? The 43rd annual Darien Road Race. Um, I sounded the air horn for um, setting the runners on their way. They had 334 participants and raised approximately $50,000. And um, all proceeds from this race this year will support youth and family nonprofit social services in Darien, Norwalk, and Stamford. Also yesterday, I attended a brief christening ceremony for the Neroten Fire Department's new boat. The Stancross family has allowed the police department and the Neroten Fire Department to operate their boat from a dock on their property, um, now known as Great Island, and the boats will continue to serve the community from the now town-owned docks. A blessing was provided by Pastor Greg Dahl of Neroten Presbyterian Church, followed by um, gathering of members from all of the all of the firehouses over at the Neroten Fire Department. Um, station and it was, um, it was great to see so many of our volunteers there. Speaking of volunteers, last, last night I was um, a guest at the Darien Sail and Pow Power Squadron dinner and the Power Squadron is very focused on teaching boating safety for our community and um, I really enjoyed the end of summer um, dinner there and I want to thank Frank Kemp for including us. As you ima can imagine, Great Island is of interest to a lot of people for a variety of reasons. NPR reached out last week to interview me about the island and its connection to a book written by Linda Civitello called Baking Powder Wars, the cutthroat food fight that revolutionized cooking. This actually is a really, really interesting book. Mm. Um, I, I had, you know, the baking powder wars, I had no idea. Um, how much baking powder was sold. I mean, I think in the 1800s, like, America bought 120 million pounds of baking powder. That's crazy. Um, as time passes, more historical details about the island and its ha inhabitants will come to light, and I have no um, doubt they'll be very interesting. Staying on, on um, Great Island, ground tours are scheduled for this Saturday, September 23rd. We will have three school buses that will run a route from Pear Tree Point Beach around the island and back to Pear Tree, um, starting at 9 a.m. and finishing up around 4.30. Registration was completed bef bef through the Park and Rec Department, and close to 700 seats were quickly filled. 
uh, because we are so we are excited to get as many residents as possible out to see the property the tour will not include time to go into the facilities but we'll make one or two brief spots and um, there is still no access for island on the island for residents by car bike or walk-ins and this holds true also for the day of the scheduled tours only residents with bus reservations will be allowed on the property um, I want to give a, a special thank you to Park and Rec. Um, they're working on a lot of things, including the um, Rocktober, Rocktoberfest in October, and um, I appreciate their help on this. Finally, the town's website is being upgraded. Tentative date for the new website to go live is September 26th. Um, Kate, I'm sure we'll have more to say that on that, but I want to thank her and her, her team for all of their hard work on, on this process. Um, it's going to help our community greatly. And uh, that's my report, and next item is we are going to hear from George Logan, who is Aquarian Customer Relations um, Director, and uh, thank you for joining us. Sure, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. I plan on keeping my portion of, a portion of the presentation to about 10 minutes. Look, what we're trying to do now is uh, uh, kind of give you a kind of a, a background of the water company and kind of the things that, that we do and what we do. Folks are used to hearing from us when there's a water main break, or when they get their bill, uh, but we're doing a lot of things in the community. So Jen, I'm going to chat about a little bit of background about Aquarion. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about co consumer usage, uh, our conservation program, um, tell a little bit about the Darien system, some of the uh, planned improvements that we have for the uh, town, and um, we'll give a little bit of a water supply update. So Aquarion was first uh, established back in uh, 1857, so we've been around for a while, right? based out of, uh, of Bridgeport. We've seen steady growth throughout uh, the 20th century. Uh, we've expanded to Massachusetts and, uh, and New Hampshire. Uh, you may recognize that fellow in the middle there, uh, P.T. Barnard, the second uh, president of the, uh, of the water company. <laughs> and the uh, story goes that he uh, uh, wanted to start the water company because there were fires downtown uh, Bridgeport and buildings were burning down Irony. businesses and he Irony. wanted to stop that so that was part of his emphasis for helping to build the uh, first uh, the water company. We've integrated over 84 water systems into our operations mm -hmm. since 2011 and as uh, many of you probably already know we were acquired by Eversource Energy back in December of 2017. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of Eversource. We have kept our uh, same uh, senior you know, management structure, uh, uh, management team I mean for the most part. Um, I, for one, for example, uh, the director, I've been at Aquarian since uh, 1992, a little over 30 years. Wow. And our president, uh, Don Morris, he's been at Aquarian since uh, the mid 90s. Uh, just at a glance, quickly, Aquarian serves uh, 86 systems in 72 cities throughout the, uh, Connecticut, Mass, and uh, New Hampshire. And to just put it in comparison, in Connecticut, we have 217,000 uh, connections, right? serving a population of over 600,000 people. When we compare that to uh, Massachusetts, which has about 9,000 connections compared to 217,000. In New Hampshire, we have about 11,000. So the bulk of our operations is uh, based out of, uh, you know, out of Connecticut. We have a rate base of about a million dollars, right? Take a look at all of our assets, all the pipes in the grounds, all the uh, pump stations and tanks. Our annual revenues are about $200 million, and we're in 59 cities and towns uh, here in uh, Connecticut. From Fairfield County to Litchfield County, we're all the way over in uh, Stonington, Torrington, we're as, as high up as uh, Simsbury as well. Um, we have uh, 249 wells, just this is just Connecticut, 27 reservoirs, 36 dams of various sizes, treatment plants, 10 surface water treatment plants, this is like when was at, at one of those plants, 70 groundwater facilities, uh, 300 and, you know, 3,447 miles of water mains. 176 water storage tanks, 98 pump stations throughout the state. Now our customer satisfaction, I know oftentimes you hear about Aquarian, is, is something that's happened in the system, but we've done our customer satisfaction survey and the vast majority of our uh, customers, 95% with the latest survey, were uh, satisfied or extremely satisfied with Aquarian Water Company. You know, our, our systems of water supplies that were pretty uh, reliable and folks turn on their taps for the most part, the vast majority were there. Historically, we are among the lowest number of complaints 
uh, for regulated utilities. That's whether it's uh, gas or electric or other water utilities. You take a look at that graph there, it shows, it starts way back in about uh, 2004, we had about 66 complaints that went to our regulators, went to PURE, uh, Public Utility Regulatory Authority, where they had to step in to help solve the problems. We thought that was just too much. So we put a concerted effort, we knocked that down in one year and a half, and over the last several years we've been in the single uh, digits. So we try to tackle and, and handle uh, issues and complaints that come up as quickly as possible before they get to the, uh, you know, to the regulators. Environmental champions. We consider ourselves stewards of the environment. Very important uh, for us. Um, when we take a look at our water quality compliance, uh, our goal is to have zero violations and in 2022 we had zero uh, violations. The environment, extremely important for us. We take a look at all of the uh, acres of land that we're uh, working with the state to help to uh, manage. Uh, we want to have a 100% environmental compliance record and in 2022 we had a 100% compliance record. Um, uh, we want to be carbon neutral by 2030. Certainly a tall order, but we're doing things like we've put uh, solar panels on treatment plants and on office buildings. Uh, we're uh, moving our fleet uh, uh, to electric, so we've been working on that as well. And we'll also, in order to get to carbon neutrality by 2030, I've, I've been asked a question, yes, we're probably going to end up buying uh, some uh, renewable energy uh, certificates uh, as well. Uh, but the beauty of that, though, as well, is that we're trying to uh, de-carbon uh, uh, the, the grid, if you will, right? We want uh, uh, folks to rely more on renewable energies uh, to supply our grid. Uh, our workforce, we couldn't do this without uh, a dedicated workforce. We're lean and mean. You know, we've got about uh, 340 uh, employees to cover the, that vast system throughout the, uh, the state. Uh, but our employees are encouraged to volunteer. You know, we, uh, a third of our employees volunteer in over 140 organizations. I, for one, happen to be the chair of our contributions committee. We give small grants to nonprofit uh, organizations. We have our water van. You mentioned that race. We need to uh, uh, invite Aquarium. We'd love to be at that race next year. Uh, so we bring out our, we provide water for events. We provide small grants to non nonprofit organizations. We want to be a part of the community. Uh, some of the challenges uh, we're facing. And again, I'm going through this quickly because i got like 10 minutes here and a lot to cover. Uh, aging infrastructure, we're all dealing with that. We have some of the oldest water distribution systems in all of the nation, right? And New England was the, one of the, you know, the first uh, areas to get developed in our, our wonderful nation, one of the original colonies. The Industrial Revolution kind of emanated from uh, our neck of the, uh, the woods. Uh, emerging contaminants, PFAS. I'm sure many of you have heard of, of PFAS. These are uh, a group of man-made chemicals, forever chemicals that we're uh, looking to deal with. Uh, lead and uh, copper rule. Um, you look at uh, service connections. You know, we've, we're doing everything we can to find lead service lines. That's the, the line between the main street and your home. Uh, so we are uh, looking at, uh, it's very costly to replace these lead service lines. We're talking in the tens of millions of dollars, but we're dedicated to do that. Stream flow regulations. Uh, our regulators, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, felt that, hey, you know, we need to do more to help to support our, our uh, the ecosystem, we are in agreement with that, but what that means is that we have to release more of the water that we're storing in our reservoirs into the environment to help the ecosystem, right? Whether it's uh, the, the fish or the natural habitat. And so that is, the reality of that is it's gonna reduce our available supply for human consumption for our area. We have, we have currently about 100 million gallons per day available. That's gonna be reduced down to 85 million gallons per day. That is sig that's significant. Over the next several years, so we have some Time. So we will need new water uh, supplies and uh, new uh, infrastructure to move the water around. That's why you see a lot of uh, big pipelines that we've been trying to move water around from a greater Bridgeport system down to the uh, southwestern Fairfield County area. We'll be doing more of that. An Asian workforce. We're dealing with an Asian workforce. Many organizations uh, are. And it is absolutely a, a, a challenge. I, I mentioned I've been at the water company for over uh, 30 years. That's not the case anymore, right? Folks are, are moving a lot. It's been a few years. They're going where the opportunities are. And so we have to uh, motivate and encourage young people to get involved uh, you know, in uh, the utilities, in the water industry. And we're working to do that. Uh, rising customer expectations. You know, we expect um, a high level of reliability when folks will turn on their faucet. When they take a shower, when they want to water their lawn, they want the water to be there. Uh, and there's uh, um, a, a price for that. New irrigation system installations, proliferation of it. More and more irrigation systems are being installed. So we're collecting water, we're moving water, we're pumping it from here to there, we're treating the water, and then we have, you know, folks are 
you know, basically throwing it up in the, in the air to water their lawns. I'll get into that a little bit, the effect of that. So what does Aquarian bring to the table, right? So these four areas are, are, I really would like to stress, right, that we're a professional organization with big responsibilities, and we recognize that. Uh, we're an experienced organization. Um, we're an experienced organization that cares about the customer. Our employees care about the work they're doing. They care about their cu our customers. Uh, we want to be responsible to the environment and show that there are actions. Uh, we uh, support uh, a knowledgeable, we encourage uh, a training, we encourage folks to go back to school, uh, we encourage to bring young folks in, and we are uh, doing our best to make sure that we have a diverse uh, workforce. Very important for us. Um, we're a highly skilled New England organization, roots and headquarters right here in Connecticut for more than 165 years. Uh, customer benefits, uh, great service, high quality drinking water, uh, industry leading uh, customer service, proven ability to manage rates and work with our regulators. Um, let me get over here. Customer usage. Let's keep going here. Single family use. Now, this looks like a bit of a, a complicated uh, looking uh, chart here, but it tells a, a lot of stuff here. But look at that, the big bar there with the big red uh, section there. One, 38% of all the water that we collect and treat and move and use around is being used to water lawns. 38%. This is why we're so focused on water conservation. This is why we're so focused on trying to do our best to, uh, uh, to save that natural resource. And when you take a look at that bar on the bar graph, we're looking at the top 1% of our users, right? If you look at the number, it's about 1,000, I think 600 uh, gallons uh, uh, per day wow. that they're using for irrigation compared to the, the rest of us. Uh, and look at uh, over to the right, for example, the top of uh, 50%. Look how much water that most folks are using. So we're trying to, to, to hone in on the top 25, that top uh, uh, high users and uh, uh, try to encourage them uh, to use less water. And that's why we jump to this twice per week uh, irrigation. Right? And uh, as you know, we're uh, during the, uh, the months between uh, uh, roughly uh, April to October, we're looking at folks with uh, address numbers uh, ending in, uh, in even numbers to water on certain days, Sundays and Wednesdays, and if you're an odd number on Saturdays and Tuesdays, it makes a difference. We look at data. This is not just uh, uh, something pie in the sky stuff. When you take a look at, for the Southwood Fairfield County, a uh, uh, total uh, demand, uh, May through June, the, um, we've got you know, years uh, to the left of the red line, going back to about uh, 2010 or so. You can see that we are knocking down demand a bit compared to the later, uh, our later years now. When we take a look at uh, days of the week, this is his, uh, you know, historical. Uh, so when we take a look at uh, May through October, uh, the blue uh, represents before we started this big effort with water conservation after the 2016 uh, drought. And look at the days of the week. The, the left pair is uh, Sunday, you have Monday, and Tuesday, and, and Wednesday. And look at the difference between uh, uh, usage uh, during, uh, prior to our conservation efforts post the, uh, the drought, uh, uh, before the drought, and uh, post. Uh, we are making a difference. And remember, when we develop our water systems, we're developing to meet the peak demands. We have to meet the peak demands. And if during the summer, because of the uh, irrigation, those demands are going up and up, not because uh, individuals, single family, uh, uh, single uh, families or households are using necessarily more water, we're using less water, but the irrigation system, that demand is going up and we have to tackle that. Uh, reductions in demand uh, down in the, uh, the, the gold uh, area there, May through October, again, uh, the change from Prior to 2016 and post, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, 704 uh, million gallons uh, per day uh, saved. That's a reduction. 704 million uh, gallons. Uh, that's significant. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 704 million gallons uh, for the year uh, in terms of the savings. It's significant. Uh, Greenwich alone, 468. Um, now, I, I would say that uh, Darian has a bit of a ways to go. I, I, we just keep it real. We are doing our, our best to get the folks in Darien to, to get on board and recognize. Uh, the first like one has been doing a great job of getting the, uh, the word out, but we have a ways to go. We have to work together. Uh, to do this. We're not asking folks not to water their lawns. We're not saying that at all. 
But instead of watering the lawns every single day, or even every other day, we believe that uh, twice per week watering um, is sufficient and will actually lead to a healthier uh, lawn. Takeaways. Uh, better understanding of uh, everyday uh, water use. And this is why we were analyzing our cus uh, consumer data. Uh, we want to know exactly what the issues are, where they are. Irrigation has become pervasive in some areas. Uh, changing behavior. We want to change the behaviors of our customers when it comes to uh, irrigation. Um, twice per week water restrictions were successful, uh, so we're going to continue to uh, do that. Right? Total demand reduction by 700 million gallons uh, per year. That is very significant. Uh, you can't fight a fire if there's no water in the tank, so why do we care about uh, conservation? Uh, communities with high rates of uh, summertime irrigation, outdoor use, uh, we'll see tank levels drop, right? Because if they're using more water, tank levels are lower, less water, uh, and uh, pressure available to fight the fires. There's a, there's a real impact uh, to it. Uh, we have pumps to uh, produce the uh, level of uh, the amount of uh, water we need to, to fight fires and emergencies, uh, but it's better to have full uh, our tanks to be full. And again, knocking down those peaks, that's what we're talking about, particularly when it comes to the irrigation systems. Uh, aquarium and, and conservation, decoupling. There was a time when uh, Aquarian, the more water we sold as a water utility, the more money we made, right? Uh, that's counter to telling folks to conserve water. So again, working with our regulators, we were able to decouple our rates. So now, uh, working with the regulators, they have decided uh, how much Aquarian is going to make it in any given year. So if it's a, a dry year, we sell more water, we give money back uh, to our customers. Uh, if it's a very wet year and we make less money, uh, we are able to charge uh, more to make up that, uh, that difference. Now, uh, we, are, uh, we don't uh, benefit or, or profit, if you will, from selling more water. Conservation is more important uh, because one, is good for the environment. Two, it helps to reduce uh, expenses. It also benefits our uh, ratepayers as well. And I mentioned stream flow regulations. Capital investment is very important. We're one of the most uh, 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 costly of all the utilities as far as uh, assets. Remember, we've got pipes, we've got pumps. Water's heavy. Uh, it's even more, even more costly than uh, electric uh, and uh, and gas. Uh, climate change issues that we have to deal with uh, as well is uh, very important. In terms of more uh, frequent uh, short-term uh, uh, droughts, more heavy uh, rain events in terms of flooding, those sorts of things. And we mentioned the drought of 2016. I'm going to keep this rolling a little bit. Uh, so twice per week, week, weekly irrigation rollout, the uh, Lyme areas there, you see most of South of Fairfield County is in that realm. That's where we have the twice weekly irrigation sort of, a, uh, not sort of, but it is mandatory. Uh, however, we have never um, arrested anyone or, or, or fined anyone, given a big giant fine. But it's more of uh, us working together, neighbors uh, kind of calling their neighbors on their uh, uh, conserving water and the neighbors aren't. And, and most of the time, it's really uh, an education piece. You know, informing and letting folks know um, uh, what we're trying to do here. Uh, this is just a map of the, of the distribution system. Uh, you know, you've got the Mansfield tank, uh, even the Wheat Hill tank in Stanford plays a, a role, and then you've got Chestnut as well. Um, extensive piping system, right, in Darien. As far as infrastructure improvements, just to give you a, a quick uh, recap here, uh, Parkland, this is for just related to Darien, Parkland pump station improvements. Uh, or some call it the Glenbrook pump station, depending on what area you are. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the midst of, uh, of doing that now. We should complete that by next year. Post road pump station improvements. Uh, we'll be working on that starting next uh, year. Water main replacement projects. We have a number of them here, just some highlights. And some are big, some are small, but we're going to uh, replace the main on Park Lane, Covers and Road, uh, Cross Road uh, near Betterment, uh, uh, Tokenik uh, Trail, uh, Cross Road, and uh, uh, Delafield as well. So we're going to be doing a lot of work in the area. Uh, we're constantly looking to uh, improve uh, reliable, reliability. We focus on areas where uh, age of uh, the main, um, history of main breaks, those sorts of things, and just uh, working with the town in terms of your paving programs and those sorts of things uh, as well. And, and here is really quickly as far as water supply update. This is the greater Bridgeport system, important because a lot of the, this water doesn't work its way down uh, this way. And in the upper right-hand corner, uh, as of uh, September 12th, We'll get another update uh, probably to, uh, tomorrow. But we're at 85%. That's pretty darn good. You look at the blue line, it's above the 20-year uh, historic average, which is the gray line there. So we're in a good spot. Earlier this year, we were, uh, we thought we were, it looked like we were racing into a drought. But as you all know, we've had a pretty uh, wet summer. But we're still going with twice per week watering. 
because water conservation is very important. 85% is still not 100%. We need to save as much of the water that uh, we have. Uh, Stanford uh, system, they're a little bit uh, uh, below average, right? but the, the light blue dotted line, that's 2016. You see how low we were there, particularly this time of the year. Uh, but uh, Stanford is at 67%. Uh, Again, not 100%. And we also have uh, Greenwich, which is doing uh, pretty good. That's a small uh, uh, reservoir, and they're at uh, just under uh, 80%. And we never know the worth of water till the well runs dry, and that is the end of my presentation. If any questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer. Thank you. George, I, I have I have two. One is yes. We have aging infrastructure, and it's you know with in your in your business we can't see it right. Yeah. So. Um, I understand that you look at water main breaks, and that's how you uh, that's how you determine where to do a project. But that seems so reactive. Do you have do, do you do anything proactive um, instead of waiting for a water main break to, to happen a number of times and then to have it bump up in your system? What, what what's your process? Sure, there's a, a maintenance aspect of these mains. So we, it's not we don't just leave them alone. To, don't do anything until they break. Uh, we have a flushing program. Uh, we add uh, certain uh, chemicals into our water uh, to uh, help uh, to make sure that it keeps the tuberculation in the middle of the <coughs> collect around the pipe at a, you know, at a minimum. And we also do leak detection. So we actually go out and we try to find leaks. We go every day, we have a crew, crews that are going all over the state and they have uh, you know, listening devices and technology uh, to try to find leaks and they got pretty, uh, pretty good at it. So that also uh, drives some of our main replacements. So we found some doozies of a leak. Sometimes a, a leaky main doesn't you know, present right. itself. Right. Uh, and so we are, very, we are somewhat proactive. And we are limited in our resources as well, uh, but we do have a, a concerted a, a plan. And we work with the towns particularly if uh, with your paid uh, programs, wherever that makes sense uh, as well. Okay. And my second question is, you know that um, I testified, as, as Paul did, on the rate hike. Yes. And I, um, it is being reconsidered. Can you give us an update on where that is? Sure. It's, it's uh, being appealed. So it's being with appealed, the courts sorry. now, right? So we're uh, hopeful that we hear something back. We haven't heard anything yet. Okay. Uh, hopefully by uh, the first quarter of, uh, of next year. First so in the meantime, we've uh, uh, kept all rates the same as they were uh, you know, prior to the, uh, to the decision. Right. And for those that don't know, Aquarian went in for a rate uh, increase, uh, first rate uh, increase uh, in uh, over uh, nine years. Uh, and we did not receive an increase, we received a decrease from our regulators. And um, so we are, we are appealing that. Uh, you know, our goal is we want to make sure that we just have the resources to uh, you know, maintain the systems uh, properly. Uh, we are going to continue to do the right thing and do what's necessary to uh, maintain our systems. We just feel that uh, uh, we need just to make sure that uh, there's a, the right balance in terms of right. rates and in terms of uh, what's needed uh, to maintain the, uh, uh, the system. Right, and I, and, I, and I appreciate that. I think the, um, the speed, you know, the, the rate increase, the number was very high, especially in a really high inflationary yes. period. So. Um, I'm, I'm um, appreciative of um, that, taking that into consideration. Absolutely. And so. again, we're working with our, our regulators and courts are involved and uh, we'll come to option. Uh, and we'll and to my, last, my last thing is I, the Hemlocks um, tour was fascinating and I really hope that you'll consider allowing maybe scouts or, or other community groups to, to take a tour of that because it really, I think it helps people understand where our water comes from and when you, when you talk about a two-day watering schedule, and I think you did a great job of, of um, presenting how effective that can be, I think, you know, if people are on site and they, they see, the, you know, they see the, you know, the, um, not the catalytic, the, um, the, the C, um, well, we have the, the whole entire treatment system. It's no, but what's the, it spins the water. Oh, the centrifuge, yes. The yes, centrifuge yes, yes, is, yes, yes. is fascinating, right? So all of that equipment that goes into producing, you know, safe, clean water for us, I think people being able to see it would be great. Absolutely. And, and so as you mentioned during the tour, thank you for that, we are considering that. Yeah, uh, for great. Sure. But as you all know, uh, following 9-11, uh, everything got kind of clamped down a little bit. So we're a lot slower yeah. in, you know, opening things up to the, yeah. to the public. But we are considering that. Uh, it's great. Well. I think people would like that. Yeah. Any questions? No, thank you so much. For yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just real quick, is I, I'm sure that you probably Aquarian runs some sort of campaign 
to sort of advertise this two-day watering cycle. Yes. Is there some way that we as a town could piggyback off of that or get some information so that we too can help promote that campaign when, you know, we're at the end of the season now, but obviously <laughs> yeah. then, things are going to come back and it's right. Absolutely. keep us in mind so that when you sure. start to roll that out, we, we'd certainly love to jump on board. And, and, and we help can help that. out in terms of, you know, we have plenty of, uh, you know, graphics and educational well, material. Well, do, you, do you do at the firehouse? That's right. You have the banners? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. put banners out yeah, yeah. throughout the system yeah. as well. And yeah. at the very end, if you're a uh, fire department, uh, volunteer fire department, they're uh, very helpful. Right. that as well they've been great uh, uh, great partners uh, we're very fortunate uh, you know to have uh, the, the municipal and, uh, and city officials uh, throughout uh, the district that are, are willing and, and understand that we, this is a partnership and uh, the fire departments have been great throughout the uh, system that's a great idea though let's think about how we can promote that a little mm -hmm. bit more love to come down and, and just sit down and, and get yeah. some things around yeah well, you for next year done a wonderful job getting the word out to the uh, water system vendors because I know at our house when we had when they come they turn it off for the winter and they come and they reset it they're cognizant of the schedules and they just set it for those you know two days because they you know the service people know that and right and that's been and that's a thank you for pointing that out that's outreach from you that absolutely come from you folks we have uh, um, a minimum a couple of meetings a year where we bring them all you know together or at least all that we can get our, our, our hands on and they will come and we talk to them about that and they understand they understand and uh, um, when they're collectively doing it it doesn't hurt any of them as far as business wise right. so right, right. Yeah. but it has to be also driven from the consumer yep. right yes mm -hmm. so that's up that's up to us yeah agree yeah again, thanks again appreciate thank it you. thank you George thank you okay. mm -hmm. Shut this down. Helps that it's not reset. Thank you. Is it going to spell that out? There you go. It's back. Yeah. Is that your back down below? That is not, no. Okay. I have to walk past it to the train, but like, I'm like, I'm going to read that. Okay. It's not good for the thing. We're not encouraging it. No. So I've been um, telling you for a couple months about um, we've been working on the website. So I thought um, I'd give you a preview Ooh. of the new website. So we're hoping to go if all goes well. So far everything's going well. We should be going live on Tuesday, the 26th. Um, so one of the reasons we undertook this was, aside from the website being a little bit older, our website was not ADA compliant. Um, a lot of our employees were having trouble maneuvering, and um, we were trying to make it easier for the residents. So one of the important things we looked at was trying to keep things to three clicks. So um, you should be able to get where you're going in most cases with three clicks. So. The first thing you'll notice on these bars, the menus drop down. You don't have to click on like town government to get where you're going. You highlight that and slide down. We'll go to boards and commissions, and it pops up with the whole list. And then you can navigate to which board, you know, the board of selectmen. Um, we also, like I said, we were not ADA compliant. Um, We've done things in our consultant has done things in this website so that um, um, slide this out. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, for people who have vision issues and use screen readers, you want to make it so that as their machine is reading it, um, it can differentiate between the title of the page, a heading of the page, a subheading. Um, you want our clicks, our, our hyperlinks, to be descriptive. You don't want it to say, to view the most recent minutes, click here. Because that click here, that's all the screen reader is going to, you know, it's going to say click here. It, they don't know what they're getting. So you see we've changed everything so that the clicks, the hyperlinks are descriptive. So that you know what you're clicking on when you do that. Um, not as evident to you in this, um, whenever you see pictures, they will now have what's called alt text. 
that describe what the picture is. So um, a reader here might say, you know, um, building at the beach. Um, not huge amounts of information, but still somebody who's got um, some sight impairments would be able to know what it is that we are seeing um, as sighted people. On the back end, um, it's a lot easier for employees to load documents, to load agendas, um, less places you have to add these things, so it should save staff time. Um, and the other thing I want to highlight that, um, go back to the, well, as you navigate around, there's some buttons that will always live on the page. So as we scroll down, these little buttons, these little round circles, and they're cute, they pop when you highlight them, see they jump up. <laughs> they, always, they live on every page, so it makes navigation easier. So you don't have to go back, oh, back, great. back. You can hop from some place, you know, one place to the other. But this one, notify me. This is, might be my favorite thing. Uh -oh. You can sign up for notifications. You'll have to, people will have to create an account. But if you want to know when the Board of Selectmen has posted a new agenda, you can sign up for a notification and you'll get an email from the system saying okay. that there's a new agenda. So we had a question earlier today from the Board of Finance who members who were interested in seeing the Parks and Rec agendas whenever they came out. They can sign up for notifications. And the Parks and Rec staff will not have to email them. The board members can sign up for themselves. Um, so any <coughs> resident can do this. And there's a whole list. It's not just about um, these kind of notifications. If we post a new job, if we post bids, if we put up a news flash, you can sign up to be notified for these things. So you can opt in or out for whatever it is you want to get. Um, with this, and I can't show you a demo of this right now, but we are also changing our citizen alert um, system, going to a thing called see, click, fix. And what I think is the best thing about that is there's an app for that. You can get it on your phone you'll be able to tell it you're in Darien. It will have some buttons that would allow you to like go right to the website from that, um, to sign up for a park and rec program right from there. But you can be out on the road and see a pothole, and you know, say you're on Long Neck Point and you see a pothole, you call up see, click, fix, you can go in, you can drop a, drop a pin, or you can type in the address, and you tell it there's a pothole, it's gonna ask you a couple questions, and it will send it off to the park term, or the public works department to fix it. So um, I think it will be a lot easier for our residents to use, especially because you can do it from anywhere. So we've been working hard on this, and I want to thank all of the employees who went through a lot of training this past week to learn how to edit their pages. I want to especially thank Linda O'Leary and Karen Dunn, who have been um, part of the team. Um, Linda has been with me through almost all these meetings looking at the colors, looking at the pictures, looking at the layouts, um, trying to make everything um, as usable as it can be. And the, the company who did this, I, I want to say one of the things they did that's kind of cool, when you look at the pictures and the buttons, they took the colors in our logo and used those to create the feel of the site. So. I'm excited, and um, I hope the citizens will like it when they see it. And like I said, it rolls out on Tuesday. That's great. Of next week. Mm -hmm. Bravo. A lot of work in this, Kate. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. That's my report for tonight. Really great. Terrific. Can uh, people get an alert when Mike makes a pithy comment? Can I send it? <laughs> <up? laughs> Uh, my phone's blown up all the time. Usage for that. It doesn't justify. Make me blow it up. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I know you guys have put a ton of work into this. It's awesome. Really, really great. Uh, next, next item. Next item up. Board liaison, Mike. Yes. Uh, the uh, Blight Review Board was scheduled to meet last Wednesday. There was a staff meeting with regard to filing the. Uh, agenda with the uh, clerk, so we did not actually uh, meet, but we will be ready to go and meet next month as scheduled on October 11th. 
The Thriving Youth Task Force uh, starts <coughs> up again for this year, and they have their first meeting this Thursday morning. And um, so I'll have more to report after that. For the Hinley Homes and Royal Building Committee, we had a meeting on September 6th in which we voted to uh, rebid the majority of the bids that had come in. Um, it would take me quite a bit to go through every single recommendation to um, bid and rebid. I'm happy to walk through with anyone we, that is in our minutes and we do have more information so if anyone asks I'm happy to provide it. Um, but we are putting those bids out. They should be going out in October. We um, are planning to come back to the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, and the RTM um, with some um, maximum price that we need to ask for. Um, we are you know, fairly positive it is going to be higher than the amounts that were originally, but we're hoping that now with additional uh, vendors coming in to bid that we should have some better options. We had many that only came in with one bid, and it's just not um, good enough because some of them were accounted for a tremendous cost. So we have worked with the uh, construction manager at um, ONGAPC, and they are going to be um, working with their sub vendors to have them come and bid on ours. So we're hopeful, and we'll have more information as those bids go out and come back in. When are they due? By the end of October, I think. But you know what? I don't. Let me get you that date. I don't have it off the top of my head. Yeah, if somebody could give us that opening date as soon as possible because. Yeah, I'll sorry. get it for you. Thanks. Uh, Great Island will be meeting, the uh, commission, the committee will be meeting this week, so uh, nothing on that right now other than just another shout out for these tours. That's such a great idea, and given the interest in that, it really just signifies that the public's super interested in the in the uh, island itself and all the work that you've done to, to lead all that. That's awesome. So that's going to be great. Um, nothing on ARPA either, since we've made a few transfers to other projects, but that's all consistent with what we've uh, said up front that we we're going to do is reshuffle some of that funding for the reasons I've described. Um, the other third thing I've done is spending time with the Coastal Advisory Commission and uh, participated in their meeting this week. I got a couple of things I can add for just topics for us to cover to help that group move forward, but super positive and they're very interested in supporting the Great Island Committee. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, no update on Mental Health Task Force. We have not met uh, since our last meeting. Oxbridge Building Committee did meet on Thursday, and it was a very almost closing to our committee. I think we've got another six months probably of just uh, paperwork interaction. But um, school is open. We are almost 99% complete. Um, ribbon cutting ceremony will be held on October 7th at 10 a.m., uh, which is the same day as the Rocktoberfest, so you can go to the ribbon cutting ceremony, take a tour of the school, and then go over and listen <laughs> to some tunes at Highland Farms. Um, only little pickle that they have, which is, you know, kind of a, a little bit um, disappointing is the slide, mm -hmm. the infamous slide. There's been some issues with the design of it. They were expecting it to be much different than what came in. They installed it, and when the teachers and the Board of Ed and the students walked out, it, there were some safety issues and some appearance issues. So as of right now, we have asked the um, consultant to go back to the drawing board and redesign this slide. So unfortunately, they've, it's not in use right now. The kids are not able to use it um, until we sort of figure out the right design with hopes that they go back to the drawing board and, and, and put a new design together on what, what the vision of the PTO and the Oxbridge um, school had originally decided on. So update on that next month and hopefully they figure that out. In terms of budget, on budget, maybe just a tiny bit under budget, which is always nice. Um, we will see, it looks as if we might come in maybe 500,000 under budget, so all good news. I'm really happy they're taking another look at the at slide. The slide. Yep. Yes, I did a tour and... Um, you didn't want to get launched. I, um, I, I, I yeah. recognize why taking another look at that yeah. is a good idea. Uh, that's it, okay. Um, public comment, Kate? I haven't seen anything. No. Um, okay, next um, item is new business. Discuss and take action on a request to recommend to the RTM the adoption of a local ordinance allowing the assessor to waive with good cause certain penalties. And we have Tony Homicki here to, um, to go through this with us.
Good evening. On uh, the assessor section of the website, you can quickly tap what's called an income and expense statement form. And with the website, I left it open. I knew you were going to do that. It'll you know, work better than ever. Anyway, I'm here tonight to just to request, uh, or at least suggest, an ordinance change, as I've referenced in the correspondence I've given you. <clears throat> Annually, all businesses in town are required to file an income and expense statement in concert with their personal property declaration. This is exclusively focused on the income and expense forms. It's a four-page document showing what the cash flow is between tenant and landlord. Um, last year, we mailed out 260 of these type documents. We received all but 47 back. Of the 47, 20 uh, plus or minus were owner-occupied. And in that situation, they do not have to file the income and expense forms. In essence, it's a nominal fiscal note issue, but it's, it's a big fist issue. When they don't comply on June 1st to us, I am mandated by statute to file a penalty. The reason why I'm presenting this uh, as the town assessor versus the Chamber of Commerce that might present it to you is because over the past uh, decade, the statute didn't have a, an enforcement date, meaning if the filing came in on June 1st, and the July bills go out. It, did, it wasn't clear in the statute if the assessor imposes the penalty 30 days after that deadline on that July billing, or if they carry it through the following year's grant list, where it would sit and not be paid for almost a year and a half. It would follow up on the following July bill. This year is different in that the statute was changed, requiring the assessor to increase the penalty the following year, meaning if they did not file for this past June, um, to increase next year's um, October 1 grand list by 10%, and then it would be July of 24 where the actual 10% penalty will come into play. My, my request is to allow me to have some latitude with the business community, the commercial property owners, to look at these ex income and expense statements, primarily in situations since, since the pandemic where controllers might have left town, a new controller might be coming through. We might not have a change of the real estate property owner's address. They might be out of town situations. It's isolated. It's not a major fiscal note issue, but I think it's good for public relations between the community, the town hall, the assessor's office, and those 200 plus real estate property owners. It's good for me because it allows me to focus on the income and expense statements. As I said, the cash flow between landlord and tenant and it, it refines the process to a very sophisticated well for me to define value and defend the assessments, especially this year because we have a revaluation for October 1 of 23. I think it's a simple ordinance. It's, it's uh, really to allow me that latitude. I welcome questions. Yeah. What's the uh, purpose for the uh, June 1, 2010 through December 1, 2010 uh, exception to the four month? Rule. And then in the waiver for good cause shown is four months except for that. That's a proposal period. that I put in place that mirrors what Meriden and Stratford have, have put into the ordinance. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been secretary of the Fairfield County Assessors and past president of the Connecticut Assessors. It's a toss up on what the specific language should be and how long it should go. The majority of the towns are given anywhere from two to four months latitude. Uh, Primarily, at the first trigger is that 10% uh, penalty date, but when the tax bills go up, that's usually when they respond back to the local assessor. It's not when the assessment notices go out, it's been when the tax bills. So, uh, so the bottom line is this just gives you the flexibility to concentrate your fines on people who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, not the inadvertent miss or the administrative miss, but, but the intentional or they're just not paying. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Is this a mix? Excuse me. Is this a mix of both commercial and residential properties? It's just commercial properties. It's just commercial properties. Thank yeah, you. Commercial retail plazas, uh, office buildings. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Okay, and did we decide whether this needs to go to the board of finance at all, or is this a, a recommendation that we so go directly to the RTM one? I would say I mean, it's an ordinance, so the recommendation to create an ordinance doesn't have to go to the. Um, Board of Finance. However, I think it would be prudent for the RTM to request the Board of Finance input. But we haven't 
it doesn't result in a great deal of revenue to us now. So it's not That's as right. though we'd be giving up significant amounts of revenue. My hope is we have 100% compliance and there's no penalties on any commercial property owners. Right. At least I can have that dialogue about their cash flow and their income expense and their relationships with the tenant and the landlord. That's our focus. To do the right thing, not to overassess, not to underassess, but to nail it. Okay. My guess is you could just offer to the Board of Finance a courtesy to say, show up at one of their meetings and review that and make exactly that I'd, point that I'd you did like. That. Sure. Uh, or the RTM could do it, but mm -hmm. just leave it to whatever the Board of Finance would request. Yeah, I think doing, I think meeting with the Board of Finance on your own, I think that's good use of time. Yeah, they'd appreciate definitely. that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Tony, I just, when I read this, um, I saw the, the penalty for noncompliance is any owner who, I'm going to skip, who submits information in, com in incomplete or false form with intent to defraud. So that intent to defraud, it just shall be subject to a penalty equal to an increase of, et cetera. So um, I'm sure when they create this ordinance that that'll be really clear that you, uh, you will not, if you're intending, that is an automatic, you're not going to be given yes. a waiver, right? And there was a day where I filed and requested income and expense data from the tenant as well as the landlord. Mm -hmm. At that time, there were long-term leases in place anywhere from 15 to 20 years. And quite often, they did not agree, mm -hmm. be it the landlord understating the values and the tenant being clear and transparent. Those days are long gone. I think the market shows a lot of visibility on market rents and contract rents. So we, I haven't seen a lot of fraud or intent to, to right. be fraudulent. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank Tony? you for your work. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Tony. You. Good. I enjoyed the NPR uh, interview. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, may I have a motion to recommend to the RTM the adoption of a local ordinance allowing the assessor to waive with good cause certain penalties? Marcy moves. Mike seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tony. Okay, the next item on the agenda, um, discuss and take action on request to amend the compensation plan for 2023-2024. Uh, we discuss this and we are going to table this to our next meeting on October 2nd. Next item on the agenda, discuss and take action on a request to transfer, transfer $7,463 to the Darien Fire Department facility repair and maintenance. Okay. Right, we're getting to the last of those year-end transfers. Um, and as you see, they needed to replace an awning that had been damaged in a storm, um, which is the reason for the increase, or the transfer request. That was the majority of it. Any questions for Kate? No. Okay, may I have a motion to approve a transfer of $7,463 to the Darien Fire Department facility repair and maintenance, Mike moves. John seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next item is to discuss and take action on a request to transfer $7,145 to the Darien Fire Department motorized equipment. Um, just more repairs. <laughs> uh, I you know, don't know how to explain it any other way. Um, I think um, in this department, our um, town mechanic happens to be their chief and he is um, very knowledgeable and does a very good job um, managing the the expense you know the repair so um, he's they're not justified. doing something that they're justified they're justified any questions no. okay may I have a motion to approve the transfer of seventy one hundred forty five dollars to Darien fire department motorized equipment Marcy moves John seconds all in favor unanimous uh, next item is discuss and take action on request to transfer $125,524 to accrued leave redemption. Right. We discussed this um, last meeting and you withheld it pending more information. The question um, from Sarah had been the um, $124,000 payout to employees. How many did that represent? Uh, that represented five. 
employees, right. but I want to tell you that of those five, of that 124, one employee represented about half, and of the remaining half, one employee re represented about two-thirds. So two employees, two long-term employees, um, represented the bulk of that. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have done work um, in our contract negotiations to try and reduce the amounts that can be um, paid out. Um, one thing that we have done with two of the unions is um, compensatory time is now paid out annually. We do have to pay it out if they've gotten it and in, in lieu of overtime, but they don't use it within a year. We pay it out in that year so it's paid out at the same rate at which it was earned. Um, where in the past it would get paid out at termination mm. and may have been paid out at a rate much higher than when it was earned. So we have put that in place with two of our unions. Um, and obviously we'll try and negotiate that with the third. Well, thank you. Great yeah. job. Well, somebody else will try and negotiate it with the third. Okay. I won't be here. <laughs> Any other questions for Kate on this? Thank you for getting that information. You're welcome. I'm always, you know, anytime like these transfers or any agenda item, when you get it, if you have a question, you know, shoot it to me because I'd rather have the the, que the answers for you at the meeting rather than have to wait. Understood. So, you know, um, understand you don't always think of it before the meeting, but if you have questions ahead of time, you know, um, we try and cover all the bases, but we don't always think of everything, so. No further questions. May I have a motion to approve a transfer of $125,500 to accrued leave redemption? Sarah moves. John seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, one of my favorite things, we have so many terrific volunteers in town, and it's a pleasure to, um, to be able to sit and learn a little bit about um, their respective commissions and, and why they're interested in um, staying on. Um, so may I have a motion to reappoint Peter Etter to the Commission on Aging for a term expiring on March 31st, 2025. Mike moves, Sarah seconds, all in favor. And may I have a motion to reappoint Sean Brown as an alternate to the Architectural Review Board for term expiring on June 30th, 2025. Mike moves. Marcy seconds. All in favor? Again, um, I'm sure I speak for the, the entire board when I thank all of our volunteers for continuing to step forward and help out the town. They're amazing. Mm. Right? They really are. They're yeah. It's just it's amazing. Uh, next item is review and approve the minutes of the September 5th, uh, 2023 regular meeting. Any edits, corrections, additions? Nope. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes as um, presented? Marcy moves. Mike seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, agenda review. Any items um, members would like to see on the agenda? I had a couple of things. So just sitting with the, uh, the Coastal Waters Advisory Commission, um, one thing is they've talked a lot about dredging and sort of where that stands, particularly for Pear Tree Point, and just getting a sense for where we've been lately and where we are on that topic, uh, and just kind of talk that through. It'd be great to get an update from the relevant folks on all that. I can give you a quick one right now. Um, we You approved transfer for us to get um, the, the estimate of there's a special word for it, but the estimated cost to have actually like thirty thousand dollars, or what do we? No, we have we have money for the bid. This was like to eight. get have a professional do an estimate of what the project would actually cost. Right. So that's going before that transfer request is going before the board of finance tomorrow night. Okay. So once that's approved, we'll go out and get that estimate of the cost to give us a sense of the magnitude of the project before we go to bid. But then the next step after that, assuming that. Um, it comes in within a range that you all in the Park and Rec Commission find acceptable, the next step would be to go out to bid. Got it. Okay. And then the second of two topics was uh, that commission is going to be ready to present some update on the Harbor Master regulations. And so one question that they had was, what's the process for going through all that? I'm assuming it's like ordinances where they would go to this board and then the RTM for approval. 
but I wasn't sure whether there was some other aspect of that or there was a state complication in, in some of the, those regs. Uh, the harbor master is going to know some of that as well, but just getting that to our council just to make sure all that yeah. is clear and buttoned up so that when they, because okay. what I'd like to do is they're talking to about, about that in the commission. I'd like to have the harbor master as well as uh, kind of a working group that those guys have but to come and present sort of the before and after on those mm -hmm. regulatory changes. Mm -hmm but confident that once they present that to this board, if we, we approve next. the recommendation to the RTM that we're all set. There's not a, a state yeah. or some other complication that we've missed that might uh, derail that process. Okay. Kathy, so. okay. Kathy. Okay. Yeah. do we need any yeah. kind of public um, public information session or hearing? Well, but, but that was, I, I don't know, I need to, I, I need to go yeah. and look and see what the, the process well, is. That was the second piece that I wanted to bring up, which is, and I, I don't know quite where we would put this in, but. Uh, this is one of those things where not everybody's going to be happy with the regulatory mm -hmm. changes because they're regulations. No one's perfectly happy with every single reg. And so what I want to do is, is figure out the best way to get those kind of regs in sort of final ready to be to presented to the public so that people can react to them uh, and then have a hearing or something like that. I think it'll be important to make sure we've got everybody at the table for that because some of this stuff will be controversial uh, because they're trying to clean up and straighten out those rules in such a way that that makes sense long term for the collective and uh, getting that done in a way that uh, is open and transparent to the public uh, and productive I think will be important and I don't have a fully formed view on kind of what the best way to do that is and I want to let those gentlemen uh, mm -hmm. actually take the lead on all that but mm -hmm. anyway just alerting this board that we want to have that discussion and and to, to do that in a way that gets us to a uh, an answer that we can all support. Okay. Yeah. I do want to just say a thank you again to the Pear Tree Beach Committee. Um, they worked very hard on that project, and one of the things that they um, that they were successful in is getting the deep approval for the dredging. So, yep. uh, a lot of work from that committee, and um, that is really appreciated. <coughs> Anything else? Nothing else? Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn? Mike moves. Sarah seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you.